Let's move away now from the primarily political and religious history that we have explored up until this point, and um, let's look a little bit more closely at the daily life of the large mass of anonymous Jews living in the land of Israel in the biblical period. And we're going to focus uh, in this little lecture on the economic life, and then there we're going to look at uh, family life and then at ritual life. But for now, economics. And let's have a closer look at this remarkable painting by Nicholas Poussin, which uh, is titled The Summer, and then in brackets, Ruth and Boaz. And obviously it's taken from the biblical story that is described in the book of Ruth, where the wealthy landowner Boaz, shown here in the center with that magnificent yellow cloak, uh, meets Ruth, who is there as a very poor mo woman, and she is uh, engaged in the gleaning. That is the, the biblically mandated leaving behind of uh, various sheaves and whatever happens to fall on the ground during the harvest season. And you get this kind of bucolic feel of the farmland and things like that. And it's really very beautiful. By the way, uh, I have a son named Boaz, and we once went to the post office, and the clerk there was so amazed, an African-American woman, that, that uh, we had a son named Boaz, who said, what do you call an unmarried Boaz? And we said, I don't know what. She said, ruthless. <laughs> At any rate, the problem with using the Bible as our source for economic history is that, as Salah Whitmire Baron, the great 20th century historian put it, it's more about the Zolan than the Zion, meaning it tends to talk a lot more about how the ancient Jews should behave than really giving us a clear picture about how they did. The, the Bible is rife with data about, for example, like in this picture, how they're mandated uh, or I should divine mandates of specific kinds of tithes and charitable donations of, of a whole variety of, uh, of, of types. And the Talmud goes on great length, uh, you know, categorizing these and talking about the stipulations of who is eligible and who is required to give and all kinds of things. Maybe we'll get to that a little bit more when we get to the Talmudic period. But nevertheless, you know, the Bible is a tremendously rich source. We just have to sort of read it backward to get a sense of what the economic history must have been like, as long as we understand that the primary thrust of the biblical text is ultimately to bring people closer to God, ultimately to make them more compliant with divine mandates, and so on. So, we do have, however, many other sources outside of the Bible for economic history in the period that we're discussing here, but they tend to be really quite fragmentary and, you know, cryptic. Like, for example, there are 102 scraps of tax receipts written on um, pieces of clay that were found in an archaeological dig uh, around the city of Samaria, Shomron, uh, believed to be associated with the palace of King Ahav. And these are essentially um, sort of tax notations. It appears that when various taxes were brought to the king, like let's say an amphora of wine or a big container of wheat or something like that, then the uh, the the probably the person who was giving the tax would write, you know, how much wine was in here and who is giving it to whom, I presume which tax collector or something like that, and the date and so on. And it was kind of like a, a primitive tax collection record system. Uh, unfortunately, of the 102 scraps, only a little more than half of them are legible and they're all like broken up like this. So it's very difficult to tease out really detailed um, analysis of the economic life, except that a there were taxes, which you know, as they say in Hebrew, yashakoach. We knew there were taxes. That's pretty much a permanent aspect of human uh, the human condition. Um, but at least we get some sense of how it must have been delivered from one place to another. However, as uh, uh, Dr. Barron also goes on. You know, Israel is one particular area, and it's true that we have this very dense text called the Bible to give us some you know, insight into the economics of the region, but we also have much data from the surrounding region, particularly the region of Ugarit, for example, uh, which would be in contemporary Syria, Lebanon, um, where if we put together all of this economic data, we can get at least some better sense of how Jews live economically, how they support themselves. Let's try and understand a little bit about what we know. So one of the, the most uh, profound shifts that we see in the Israeli economy, or the 
economy of the Jews of ancient Israel is the shift from animal husbandry to agriculture. Um, in this portrait, not a uh, Jewish portrait, uh, obviously it's a Christian portrait from uh, Botticelli, The Trials of Moses. Moses is shown here in uh, a yellow robe and there's kind of like a sort of like a comic book panel with all kinds of adventures that Moses had in his life and you can see he's rep reproduced several times over. And in several of them he is shown as a shepherd. And in fact the uh, identification of Jewish leaders with uh, shepherding is quite profound and it has, you know, philosophical ramifications as well. But David is a shepherd, Abraham is a shepherd, um, Moses is a shepherd. Over and over again we see animal husbandry as a feature, particularly of uh, Jewish leaders. Uh, when the Jews enter Israel, however, it's clear that there is a shift from animal husbandry to agriculture. And that makes sense because Israel is, after all, quite a diverse area. There are 40 distinct geographic units of the economy in ancient Israel. And the, the way that the Jews were settled at the time, and, and I'm now sort of generalizing, by the way, over like a little over a thousand years, um, there are 400 settlements, which are called Arim in Hebrew. We would translate that as cities, but with less than a thousand people in each of those cities to be sure. There are essentially farming communities that would have some kind of village settlement, perhaps with some kind of wall around it, uh, to protect them from marauders. If you have a look at the, the map of ancient Israel, you can see that it is dotted with a wide variety of economic resources. Looking from the north, which would be closer to the region of Lebanon, you have timber, of course, the cedars of Lebanon. Uh, you have mines for iron and copper. It will be especially important once uh, coinage begins to be produced. You have the so-called Tyrian purple, in Hebrew known as argaman, which is produced from a particular kind of sea creature that lives uh, on the shoreline, and it's it is it's essentially. Um, uh, harvested for its blood or some other, um, you know, bodily fluid that is then made into the techelet, the um, the specific uh, color that is used. Um, orchards, you have uh, textiles are very big uh, produce. Um, iron, salt, metalwork mines, and of course dates, uh, especially around uh, Jericho, very very. Um, important export. The Jews were known especially for the date palm. And uh, so you can see there's all kinds of different industrial activities going on in ancient Israel. In terms of commerce, I mean, obviously that flows from the variety of goods that are available in the area. Uh, biblical text refers to what we might call guilds, we, we, uh, artisans, individuals. Uh, sometimes, especially in the Talmudic period, you, there are particular um, towns that are devoted to particular crafts, like, for example, villages that are filled with tanners, that all they do is they tan leather and so on. We do have biblical references to Jews engaging in international trade, especially during the high point of the United Monarchy under Solomon, when, of course, they moved to the divided monarchy and their civil war, um, the, the northern kingdom of Israel in particular begins to lose its sway, its international sway over the region, and so they're cut off from a lot of their natural markets and a lot of their natural resources. But we see the economy gradually growing from that original animal husbandry through uh, industry and then commerce, and ultimately you have regular coinage produced by the 6th century before the Common Era. And I just want to show you this one great image. This was just discovered this month, a uh, two-shekel weight from the first temple period. Obviously, it's the stone on the left there. Uh, can you imagine what it must have been like to deal with these weights and measures in your daily uh, shopping runs? Okay, I hope you found that interesting, and uh, we'll continue by looking at family life in the, uh, the next short video. Thank you for watching.